Good afternoon or evening and welcome. Kensington Senior Living has seven unique communities, four located in Virginia, Maryland, and New York, and three sister communities located in California. Kensington is truly privileged to support care partners and professionals from coast to coast. We focus on relationship-based care, care built on the foundation of our promise to love and care for your family. That promise is what initially drew me to become a member of the Kensington family as my father lived there for almost seven years. It is programs such as the one you are attending now that are so important for those of us walking through a caregiver journey to hear from experts on keeping us current with the latest advances in care management and treatment of conditions that affect seniors and their families. All registrants will receive a copy of today's webinar to share with friends and family. Please also use the Q&A function to submit questions during our live Q&A. Today, you're in for a treat with Chef Annie Fenn. I've had the opportunity to work side by side with Chef Annie and her food is not only healthy, but incredibly flavorful. Her book is amazing and it's that time of year for gifts. Annie Fenn is a physician, chef, and founder of Brain Health Kitchen, the only culinary school of its kind focused on fending off age-related cognitive decline. She teaches the Brain Health Kitchen method of cooking throughout the U.S. and abroad. Her mission is to help you care for your brain while still eating delicious food. Chef Annie Fenn, can you please join me? Annie is clearly still getting those cookies into the oven. So when you get a minute, Annie, please join the audience. But I will share with the audience while we're waiting with Annie that Kensington produced a webinar last week on November 29th. I encourage everybody to take a look at it. It's on the websites. And we had a special guest, Dan Gibbs, who is a neurologist from Oregon. Annie knows who uh, Dr. Gibbs is, neurologist from Oregon that has Alzheimer's. And in his conversation with me, he shared that he is 100% certain that he has fended off the progression of Alzheimer's through eating brain healthy food and adhering to the mind diet. So thank you, Chef Annie Fenn. And please share a few words about yourself and then we'll get started. Hi, everybody. Hi, Susan. Thank you for having me. It's always such a pleasure to, um, to cook with you all and welcome to my kitchen in Jackson, Wyoming. You can see we've got snow. Um, we're going to be playing with the light because it's that time of day where it's going to be really bright and then it's going to be like pitch dark, <laughs> like in an hour. And so um, no matter. And um, it's just been really fun to prep this class for you because what we're, what we're going to be cooking today are some of my favorite family recipes. Some of the cookies I really just only make around the holidays, which makes them feel so special. And it's also giving me a head start on holiday gifting because a lot of these uh, of the treats here and also the soup are things that I would give away as gifts over the holidays to friends and family when I drop by. So um, I hope the menu will give you a head start on all of that as well. Uh, we have a lot of recipes to share. We're making uh, chocolate and, and uh, pistachio biscotti, which is an old family recipe of mine. Um, I don't even remember the origin of it, but I do know that my grandmother used to make it and she was from Italy and she immigrated to Rochester, New York. And she used to make baked goods like this from scratch. And I've changed it over the years as I do um, to make things just more nourishing for the brain. You know, we know that one of the foundations of brain healthy eating and cooking is to, you know, switch up the fat profile of what we eat, you know, more olive oil and less butter. So these biscotti actually use extra virgin olive oil instead of butter. They don't have a lot of sugar. They're packed with things that are really good for your brain, like pistachios and really good dark chocolate. And instead of using all-purpose white flour, which I think was pretty traditional in my grandmother's recipe, um, I'm using almond flour. This makes it accessible for people who can't you know, consume gluten for the gluten-free friends and family. Um, but almond flour also, because it's nuts, it has a lot of protein. It has a lot of brain health nutrients. So it's one of those brain healthy swaps. It's just a win-win. You know, not only is it more nutrient dense and, and um, better for you, it's also more tasty because, you know, the almond flour is just delicious because these cookies are really nice flavor. So if you're cooking with me along at home, 
Um, I'm going to give you a couple tips for making the biscotti. I had to get those started already, and I have them in the oven. But um, just know that this is kind of a wet dough. You might want to take notes. You're going to be cooking this later. Um, it's kind of a wet dough, which is not unusual at all for this, this type of, of cookie. Um, so sometimes you can get, just get some flour, some regular flour. I use um, white wheat flour. You could use more almond flour and put it down on a board. And what you want to do is take all, the mass of cookie dough into two lumps, two equal parts, and just shape them into logs. And you can decide, you know, do you like like the little tiny biscotti that comes with a cup of coffee? Do you like the really tall ones that come in a jar when you go to a coffee shop? I go for the little ones actually. Um, feels like I'm eating more and <laughs> but it's actually less. Um, so I make I make long skinny logs, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, I'm baking those now. When those come out of the oven, we're gonna let those cool. And then I'll show you how I slice those into individual biscotti, okay? Um, after that, you go, they go back in the oven. The thing about making your own biscotti is that if you like them really crunchy, you just bake them for longer on that second bake. Biscotti means twice baked. Um, if you like them a little bit more crumbly and not so crunchy, um, then you just do it for less time. I'm somewhere in the middle in terms of the, the crunchiness of mine. So we got that going already. Um, the second recipe I'm sharing with you is from my book, which I'm really excited about. This is the book that I wrote that came out in January of this year. It's book, book birthday is coming up in less than a month, which is just astounding to me. It's been a, a crazy busy year um, and a really fun one. But we are going to be making the chewy chai sliced chickpea cookies. Um, so this is also a gluten-free cookie. And it's not that gluten, gluten containing flours are bad for the brain. Um, I talk about that in the book. It's just that I, I like to lean on gluten-free flours because they're more nutrient dense. You know, all-purpose white flour doesn't really have anything to offer us. It's very refined. It hits our bloodstream almost like sugar. It's a refined carbohydrate. And so, um, you know, what I like to do is use like almond flour. And these, these cookies have like oat flour and chickpea flour. And chickpea flour is just what you think. It's, it's chickpeas, beans, garbanzo beans that have been ground into a flour. And it may not be very traditional in the United States to cook with chickpea flour, but it's very common in many parts of the world. Um, so chickpea flour has this like nutty flavor. It's not really beany. It's just adds a, a savory note, which I really like in a cookie because I don't really like my cookies to be super sweet anymore. Um, I, I just don't really like things to be very sweet. It's part of the brain healthy diet where we, we cut back on sugar and in all the baked goods that I make, I cut it down to the point where um, it's just really just barely there. It's definitely there, but just barely. So what I've got going on here is the chewy chai spiced cookies ready to go into the oven. And this is also kind of wet dough. You can just wet your hands or use two spoons to do it. Um, what I'm pressing into the top is pieces of candy ginger. And those look really nice. Um, when they come out of the oven, almost like a chocolate chip cookie, but instead of chocolate, it's ginger, chunks of ginger. And the spices in this are, are you know, I, I've got the inspiration from chai tea. There's black pepper, there's cinnamon, there's cardamom. It's a assertively spiced cookie. It's a cookie for, I like to think it's a cookie for grownups um, more than kids. Although some of you kids might love it too. So these are going into the oven. Now, the hardest part about this recipe is not snacking on all the candy ginger you have around because you're making it. I'm going to put it over there so I can't see. And Annie, do you just purchase the candy ginger? Do you recommend making it? Can you make it? Um, I don't make it. I know that the way to do that is to take uh, fresh ginger and cook it in a simple syrup, kind of like making... Uh, you know, like uh, candied orange or candied lemon. Yeah, it, it's actually not that hard to do, but it's a process of multi-steps. So I skip that part and I just buy it and I can find it in bulk in the grocery store where I live. And I can also find it um, over by like the dried fruit. So here's the biscotti coming out of the oven. Oh my gosh, it smells so good. It smells very chocolatey like a brownie, um, but also very nutty from the pistachios. So we're gonna let these guys cool. And I'm gonna turn down the oven a little bit. Got different bake times going on here. 
And Annie, if you know, you and I were talking before about freezing things before the guests come and the relatives come and all that. If you were going to freeze the ginger cookies, would you freeze it in in a big ball or would you freeze it after you cook the cookies? I would just freeze the cookies after they baked. Okay. Yeah. Same with the biscotti. I would I would freeze them after they baked. Now with the biscotti, sometimes I add a chocolate drizzle, which everybody loves. And we can do that too. And you can even do that and then freeze it. Um, all of these recipes are really great for making ahead. Um, well, I was thinking for hostess gifts, how great is that? You make you know a couple of those and you get a cute little bag and ribbon and you're ready to go. Yeah, and because biscotti are not, you know, they're they're kind of a dry cookie anyways. They're really amenable to making ahead and gifting, and they don't suffer from sitting in a tin for a couple of weeks at all. You know, they're still actually going to be really good probably in the new year but they won't last that long. <laughs> That'll be impossible. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and put the cookies in the oven. Now take some notes about the, the chewy ginger cookies. Two things. When you put these on the cookie sheet, it's really important to use a brush or even a spray to put some oil on the parchment paper. Otherwise they might stick. So that's really important. And number two, just make sure that you under bake these a little bit the cooking time is, I think, six, no, eight to nine, eight to nine minutes. Um, but your oven could run a lot hotter than mine. And I recommend having an oven thermometer so you kind of know how your oven runs so that your recipes turn out better. But it's really important to under bake because they're just going to lose their chewiness if you let them go too long. So the first time you make them, just kind of hover and just make sure that you are pulling them out of the oven when they look like they're slightly underdone. I'm going to set my timer for six minutes, and then I'll show you what that looks like, that underdone sort of cookie look. Okay. Oh, it smells so good in here. Are there any questions Well, before we start the, uh, the stew? I'm going to go ahead and get everything ready for that. I know that a lot of you, you know, you love to cook and you love to cook for the holidays and you want things to be healthy too. You still want them to be really good. And that's, that's kind of where I'm coming from. Like I want the food to be just as like celebratory and delicious. And here's a, here's a tip too. If you're just starting to cook um, from brain healthy recipes or following, you know, a more healthy formula for a lot of your baked goods, you don't need to really tell everybody what you're doing. You know, you can just, give cookies or make a nice soup and just let people enjoy it um, instead of telling them that like, this is the healthiest cookie you'll ever eat. <laughs> we do have a few questions. Oh, yeah. uh, one question that's the easiest is where do we get the recipes from? And everybody that registers for this uh, webinar, we encourage you to share it with friends and family. We'll be given all the recipes for all of this. And Annie has something kind of exciting to announce regarding her newsletter. Do you want to share that with the audience, Annie, real quick? Um, sure. So I'm I'm rolling out a holiday promotion for my newsletter. Um, my book launched in January of this year. And in December, I uh, last year, I actually launched a newsletter to go with it. And people are like, why are you writing a newsletter? You just wrote a book. Well, the reason was, even though this book is 400 pages and it's chock full of science and 100 recipes, there was so much more that I wanted to share with everyone. There's actually just so much more science. There are more recipes. I'm constantly coming up with new recipes. Um, so I launched the Brain Health Kitchen newsletter. They're kind of, it's kind of a companion thing. A lot of people get the book and then they follow along with the newsletter too. So I write two twice a week. Um, when a new study comes out, what I do is I just like to break it down before the headlines get out of control. It's so hard to know what's going on, you know, in science and medicine with a lot of the way the media presents things, especially with dementia, which is a really hot topic now. You'll read that this prevents dementia, this prevents, this causes dementia. So I like to try to drill in on the details so that people know, you know, what's important and what's not. Um, so yeah, so I'm doing a buy one, give one special, where if you purchase an annual subscription, then you can give one away as a gift. And it makes a great gift. I've had, I have a lot of people who have gifted the, the newsletter. And then and I'm doing a scholarship program for people that can't afford it. They can email me and, and get on the list for the scholarship program, giving away 25 of those, um, plus whoever wants to buy one, give one. 
doesn't have someone to give it to, they can just put it into the scholarship. What a great yeah. gift to give to one of your children or your mother or your sister or your best friend. I I subscribed right away when Annie started it. And I will tell you, not only is it filled with, well, first of all, it's fun to read because the, I can just hear you talking throughout the newsletter and it gives so much good information and you really drill down and break it down. You know, you start reading all this stuff on the news about Linkembi and about sleep. You did something on sleep and about this and about this new you know, supplement and you really break it down. So it's really helpful. I must say, I really enjoy it. And we do have a lot of fun. I know this sounds funny because we're talking about preventing dementia and Alzheimer's, which is very serious business, right? But as a community over at the newsletter, um, everyone's participating, it's interactive, people are helping each other out. I don't feel so alone in my journey with my mother because I feel like I have this, this really vibrant community that you know we're all sort of being proactive about our aging, trying to learn what we can about preventing dementia and just cooking really good fun food and you know not obsessing too much about having to be overly healthy. Like my food is actually um, not quite as austere as some other healthy cooks you might you might meet. Would you would you agree, Susan? Oh, some of the spices and herbs. It's actually made me a better cook doing your recipes because I used to fear some of those spices or herbs and how to use them. And it just, it just makes your mouth sing. It really doesn't. And just made a comment. She said, thank you for the recipes. I have your book and I love the recipes. I also love your newsletter. Thank Aww. you, Anne. And then someone just asked about coconut oil and preventing dementia. Yes, um, we we should talk about that. Let's get our stew started. So one of the no, recipes, you keep going, you keep going, and I'll just jump and we'll in when we have the oil because I want to talk about that. So one of the recipes that we're doing is called the um, cranberry bean and chicken sausage stew. And here's into the book. A lot of my friends sign their favorite recipes, so <laughs> you can see my friend Lisa like wrote all over most of this recipe. <laughs> it's her favorite recipe. So the first thing we're going to do is um, is we're going to brown some chicken sausage. I actually used turkey sausage because that's what looked best at the store. And I do a lot of these swaps and substitutions when I'm cooking. And I hope you do too, because what you want to do is find, you know, the, um, the thing that's going to be the highest quality, you know, in the meat, poultry, and egg chapter of the book. Not everyone eats animal products, but if you do... I like to go into, you know, how to buy them. You know, what's the best quality meat? How do you choose meat that's lower in saturated fat? That's why I like to land on chicken and turkey and sausages made from that. Um, they're very flavorful. You do have to cook them pretty gently. Like I'm not frying this till it's brown. I'm trying to be very gently cooking it here and just partially cook it. And then it's going to go into the soup. Um, and there's only a half a pound of, ground meat in this huge pot of soup. So it's mostly vegetables, legumes, um, but there's a little bit of meat there because, you know, meat provides protein, it provides some other things that you like, and you can certainly leave the meat out and the stew would be like, really, still really, really good. And why sausage and not just ground turkey? Um, you can use ground turkey. The It's sort of a shortcut because the sausage already has all these spices in it. Um, but sometimes I don't like what I see at the grocery store. Like I like the chicken or turkey sausages that they make at the grocery store. I don't like the stuff that, that comes from other places or I'll go to my whole food butcher and, and I know that he makes it with really good ingredients. Yeah, right? That's such a good point. I, I, uh, yeah. I go, Look, I'm going to just get ground chicken or ground turkey and I'm going to add some more spices myself. So here we have our chewy chicken beans. Oh, those look so chicken. good. I'm really excited. Um, so I want you to see how they are, these are kind of actually perfect. This was, this was seven minutes, but the oven was a little bit hotter than usual. So when you touch it, you don't really, you can make a little dent, but it's not wet in the middle. Okay. That's what you want. They're still tacky in the middle, but they're not wet. So you want to take them out when they're slightly underdone. And that's how you make these cookies really great. By the way, another Anne just said, I'm another Anne. I love your book too. Drew Ramey talks about you a lot. Drew Ramsey. Oh, Drew. Yeah, Drew is a, Drew is a friend of mine. He's, um, he's a nutritional psychiatrist. He's been talking about food and mental health for years, one of the first. And I knew him 
I've known him for a really long time. He used to come out here to snowboard out to Jackson. Oh, that's funny. Day, he uh, sent me a message on Instagram. I'd never met him before. We were just like basically Instagram pals. He messaged me and says, hey, Doc, do you want to go skiing? <laughs> sure. So I ran out to the, I live really close to ski area. So I ran out there and we started hanging out. And since then, we've done lots of things together, collaborations, um, you know, cooking classes, um, he looked at my book manuscript before it went to print. He wrote a blurb for the back cover. I mean, oh, that's so sweet. And he moved to Jackson. So he's in, so um I get to see him all the time now. Speaking yeah. of Instagram, you should all follow you should all follow Brain Health Kitchen. As I was scrolling through mine before this event, I noticed an Instagram on the cookies we're doing today. The oh, yeah. chai cookies, and they look delicious. Thank you. The uh, cookies, just, I mean, they're so fun to say, the chewy chai spice chickpea cookies. <laughs> and there's always that element of like, are there actual chickpeas in this cookie? Not really. It's actually the chickpea flour, which is one of my favorite ingredients. So my, my um, turkey is slightly browned, not overdone. Um, a little bit underdone. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't eat it like this, but it's going to go into the stew and finish cooking. So we're going to take that aside. We don't want to overcook it. We're just going to let that cool off a little bit. I'm going to add a little bit more olive oil to the pan. I give you measurements for everything in the book and in my recipes, but as you'll notice, I, uh, I don't measure a lot when it comes to things like olive oil and salt because I have a really good feel for what the recipe needs. Um, and then we're going to take, you know, I have onion. That's one yellow onion chopped. I have celery. That was about three sprigs of celery chopped. I have carrots, about three medium carrots chopped. And this is one, we're gonna go ahead and just um, cook these down for about five minutes. You know, when you're cooking vegetables like this to make soup, one of the ways you build flavor is to cook them slowly um, over a longer period of time. Think of like caramelizing onions. If you try to do it too quickly, you know, the onions will be done, but they're not gonna be quite so as flavorful if you let them go a few more minutes. So we are going to let this get nice and soft and translucent. I'm also going to add a teaspoon of salt and some pepper, fresh ground pepper. Now, this is a recipe where I like to use um, some convenience foods. I mean, you can you use everything from scratch if you want. Like you can cook the beans from scratch um, and have those ready. You can make marinara sauce from scratch, which I do all the time. Um, but I'm maybe just as likely to use, you know, a convenience food. I like to think of some of these minimally processed foods as conveniently healthy because if you look at the ingredient list of, of this, it's one of my favorite marinara sauces. Um, it's really just tomatoes, garlic, olive oil. There's really nothing in there that I am opposed to in a brain healthy diet. Although a lot of marinara sauces will have added sugar. They will have, um, like they'll actually have added oils, like seed oils, sunflower seed oils, safflower oils, things like that, um, that you, know, you wouldn't use at home because it wouldn't be delicious. Um, and a lot of added salt. So this is a good one, but I just as often like make it myself from canned tomatoes. But if I don't have time, it's really nice to have that. And that goes into the soup. And the other thing that goes into the soup, it calls for cranberry beans, but I couldn't find them. Cranberry beans are a really beautiful um, sort of purple colored bean. They're an heirloom bean. They usually have them at my grocery store or I order them from manchogordo.com, which is a company that um, specializes in heirloom beans. But no worries. If you can't find them, then you can just use another bean that you like. A, a nice sturdy bean would be good. So I'm using cannellini beans and I like to buy them in these jars. This is one of the brands I like. It's Jovial um, or I'll get it in a can. I like to buy low sodium canned beans when I can. And I want to make sure the can is non-toxic, BPA free and all that. Um, but canned beans or jarred beans are also like another conveniently healthy food that you can just have in your pantry. And it really speeds up the time for you to get, you know, meals done. You shouldn't be expected to cook everything from scratch. I don't have time to do that. And I know you don't either. So um, I'm willing to take a little bit of help. 
all this talk about processed food um, is different. This is talking about ultra processed foods. These are, you know, these are the foods that are basically all the junk foods in our system. Those are the ones we want to avoid. We want to embrace the ones that make cooking easy, like frozen vegetables and, you know, some canned foods and things like that. Frozen berries, great, great convenience food. So this is looking really good. I'm going to turn down my oven because we're going to bake those biscotti again. Oh, so coconut oil. The question was, um, does coconut oil reduce the risk of dementia or does it treat dementia? Something along those lines. Uh, the question was uh, thoughts on coconut oil from preventing dementia. Oh, sure. So um, coconut oil is really confusing for people because it's marketed as a brain health food. Okay. Um, even though there's no data to say that, like no data whatsoever that says if you consume a lot of coconut oil, you'll actually, your risk of getting Alzheimer's or another type of dementia goes down. It's actually the opposite. And the reason for that is that coconut oil contains mostly saturated fat, 94, 95% saturated fat. Now, saturated fat is not like evil or anything. Like it's in butter, it's in red meat, it's in cheese, it's in coconut oil, it's in a lot of things. Um, but we definitely want to try to limit the amount of saturated fat that we consume. That's basically the backbone of a brain healthy diet. It's mostly monounsaturated fats, like you get from olive oil, nuts, seeds, um, avocados, or polyunsaturated fats, like you get from some cooking oils or fish and seafood. That's like the backbone of the brain healthy diet. If you can picture the Mediterranean dietary pyramid, all those foods on the bottom, those are all monounsaturated fats. Now, the ones that we can have sometimes maybe as treats, like when we're um, having you know, cheese because it's special occasion or like red meat, we don't eat red meat much. We just really wanna limit these foods. So someone who consumes coconut oil every day, um, it can actually have an impact on their blood cholesterol. And we know we did a long, we did a series on this, right, Susan, on the newsletter about cholesterol in the brain. Um, you need cholesterol for overall health and brain health, but it should be like very, very low as an adult. And most people's cholesterols are really high. Uh, we now have good scientific studies that show that consuming coconut oil every day can actually raise your, your um, harmful cholesterol by about 10%. And that translates to increased risk of heart disease, like heart attack and stroke, as well as Alzheimer's. So I don't like people to go crazy on the coconut oil. I do have a small jar in my pantry. I use it for stir fries because I like the flavor. I have one recipe in the book that's um, turmeric and black pepper granola. I use coconut oil for that. It's kind of, um, the flavor is just really great for that. You can do it with olive oil too, but um, I just like it with coconut oil. And so I just buy small jars and I use it sparingly. And um, you know there is some data looking at treating people with Alzheimer's with um, these types of fats and also with ketone bodies. And the reason for that is um, once someone already has Alzheimer's disease, they can no longer process certain fuels like the glucose you get from most food, but they do respond better to ketones. So there's one type of fat that's in coconut oil. It's called medium chain triglycerides or MCT. And their scientists are looking to see like, does that help with symptoms? And there are some randomized controlled trials that show that yes, you take someone with Alzheimer's disease who already has it, give them MCT oil, they may have some improvement in cognitive function. This is not standard care yet. This is just still being investigated. Um, I think the important thing is you said yeah. all already have, um, not yeah. really a preventative. And, and I also just want to emphasize what you said about the cholesterol in your newsletter was so great for it to have an understanding, but really what's good for your heart is good for your head. Yeah. Yes, everything that you've already learned about taking care of your, your heart, like reducing your risk of heart attack and stroke by you know, having a healthy weight and exercising and cutting back on salt, all of those things mm -hmm. pertain to your brain health. About half of all Alzheimer's actually has a very strong vascular component. Um, so there's, you know, the lines are very blurry between the different types of dementia, and that's why. And I'm going to ask this question because I think it follows in really well. And that is the microbiome. Does it have an impact on brain health? Oh, the microbiome. Absolutely. That's one reason why we want to eat all these cruciferous vegetables and, you know, all this plant fiber. The more that the more we learn about brain health, the more we understand that what's happening in the gut in 
with the hundreds of trillions of microbiota that live down there in your intestinal tract, they actually are creating bioactive substances that, that impact your brain health. A lot of these are anti-inflammatory. Some of those are neurotransmitters. For example, one is GABA, which is a neurotransmitter that can be um, in short supply in someone with Alzheimer's disease. So there's all these interesting connections in the brain-gut connection. But the most, the only thing you need to really remember about the gut microbiome is that these, these healthy gut bugs, they need to eat fiber. Fiber is what they eat. That's why fiber is one of the most important tenets of a brain-healthy diet. That's why it's full of beans and it's full of vegetables and lots of other fiber-rich foods. So I'm going to go ahead and add... Um, so I'm using Savoy cabbage, the recipe call, I know calls for green cabbage. I'm adding Savoy. I'm adding it a little bit later than I normally do. Normally I would just add it with the other vegetables, but this cooks a lot faster. And I just like Savoy. It's, um, it's a pretty cabbage and it's a little bit more delicate and I just really like it in a soup. So we're going to go ahead and add that. And we're going to add, I'm using chicken broth since I'm using you know, poultry sausage. And this is just a, a low sodium brand. I didn't have, I didn't have, a, it calls for six cups. I only have four. So I'm going to add two cups of water. So, you know, these recipes, you can really, soups and stews are very, very um, forgiving. You can um, you can add some water if you don't have broth, you can change up the type of cabbage. If you don't have a yellow onion, you could probably use um, some leeks, that would be really good, or some scallions. I'm a big believer in using what you have on hand, so you don't have to like run after the grocery store and make yourself crazy with, with every little detail. And the recipes will be very forgiving. They'll be very good, and you might even come up with your own favorite variation. Um, I'm going to go ahead and add those cannellini beans. So these are from the jar. These were two jars, which is about three cups. And I rinsed them, add those. And next is our marinara sauce. Now you can see how hearty this is going to be. It's got vegetables, it's got sausage, it's got cabbage, it's got beans. It's really great for feeding the crowd. And Susan was asking me earlier, like, should she make that ahead of time and, and serve it later? Because, you know, the holidays are coming up. We have a lot of people visiting, some of us, and we don't want to be cooking 24-7, right? Um, so, yeah, this is a great make-ahead recipe. The only thing I will do differently if you're making it ahead and freezing it is when the soup is almost done, I add the pasta, which you can leave out if you don't eat pasta, but... Um, this is Fragola sarda. It's a kind of like a couscous. It comes from the island of Sardinia. You're finding it in most grocery stores now. And I really love it. It's like this chewy, nubby pasta. You can also use orzo or another small format pasta that you would put in soup. But if you're going to freeze it, leave this out. And then when you defrost it and heat it up on the stove, add the pasta before you serve it. That way it won't get all gummy. It'll that be. was actually a question from uh, a couple people. I'm having large people come in. I mean, large groups of people. What can I make ahead of time and freeze? And that would be a great alternative. And what about for our vegetarians in the audience? Could you make this without the sausage? Oh, absolutely. Just just leave it out. Absolutely. Yeah, just leave out the sausage. Um, it's great. It's great as a bean stew, um, bean and vegetable stew. It has a ton of flavor. Yeah, you don't really need to, you might want to add some spices that would make up for like the sausage component, maybe some red pepper flakes, maybe a pinch of oregano, if you like that sort of thing, and it'd be all good. Yeah. Oh, okay. I almost forgot the secret ingredient. Do you know what that is? No. This comes from my grandmother. This is one thing I always remember about her cooking. Whenever she made soup or stew, she would take a Parmesan. Parmesan rind. rind. Yeah, she would save these. She was incredibly frugal. She never threw out a scrap of anything, okay? And she had a coffee can in her refrigerator in the back, and it was full of these. And she just saved them. And, um, you know, my family went through a lot of Parmesan cheese, apparently. Um, and then she would just add it to a soup, um, like a minestrone. And what it does, and certainly you can leave that out if you don't eat cheese, but what it does is it adds, you know, Parmesan has a special flavor that, 
has been described as umami. It's like a deep, rich, kind of a little bit salty flavor. And as the soup cooks, the Parmesan rind kind of gets all melted and releases those flavors. Yeah, and it doesn't disappear entirely. So if you forget to fish it out at the end, then um, someone will be like, what, what's in my soup? <laughs> that, that happens all the time. Um, so we are gonna take a look at this. These biscotti. And Speaking of the biscotti, does whole grain flour compare to gluten-free in terms of brain health? Um, well, they're, all the flours are a little different. They all have some pros and cons, you know what I mean? Um, whole grain flours are really good for you. If you go whole grain, you know, like 100% whole wheat or um, einkorn wheat is one that I really like. Um, there's also like barley flours, rice flours, things like that. Um, the difference between that and all-purpose white is that all-purpose white has been processed to take out the germ in the middle of the wheat kernel. And that's where the vitamin E is and all the healthy fats. Um, these grains actually have healthy fats, but not when they're processed. So the processed grains lose all that because it, they have to be shelf stable. And they right. can't have things like vitamin E in them because they'll go rancid. You won't be able to keep them like at you know, Walmart for a year on the shelf, right? right. So, um, so these processed flours just don't really have any nutrition left. And because of that, they kind of hit your bloodstream almost like sugar. You know, they're just rapidly broken down. So whole grain flours are great. They provide antioxidants like vitamin E, they provide fiber. Um, Gluten-free flours are also like really nutritious. And that's why I cook with them so much. Now, I'm not gluten-free, no one in my family is. I do it for the nutrition and the flavors. Like buckwheat flour is one of my favorites. I use oat flour a lot. So mm. the cookies. Um, there's some oat flour and some chickpea flour. And I um, I don't buy the oat flour at the grocery store, although you can do that. I just take rolled oats and I throw them in my blender and I pulse it until it looks like flour. And that's oh. why it, it's fresher. It smells good. You're like making your own flour. So that's kind of fun. Um, but it's actually a more efficient, flavorful way to do it too. And you uh, don't roast those first. You just put them right raw right in there. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. I'm going to try that. I think oat flour that's like a little bit, um, you know, it's got some texture to it. So all the fiber hasn't been worked out of it. So things like that. There, There's just this whole world of, you know, nutritious flours that, that, you know, when you grow up in the United States, especially, you just don't get exposed to it. And we're missing out on a lot of really cool flavors. Like buckwheat, I was saying, is one of my favorite gluten-free flours. Um, it's got like this whiny berry-like flavor. Um, I use buckwheat and a pancake I have in the book and some other. I made things. those. They were absolutely, they're my son's favorite. Yeah. And then when you're talking about the chickpea flour, you know, for the cookies, it's sort of, you know, I meet a lot of people who'd say they don't like beans or legumes or they can't eat them for whatever reason. And probably because they haven't introduced that to their system enough. Um, most people can eat beans if they, you know, introduce it slowly over time. But chickpea flour is sort of my gateway for getting some legumes which is such a brain healthy food group um, into people who don't care for beans. Okay, so I don't know if you can, let me push this back. So I have my logs of chocolate pistachio biscotti and they're cool enough to handle, so that's perfect. And I have my serrated knife, which you might wanna make a note of because um, you don't wanna cut them and have everything crumble. Like this works, this works really well. And then you can decide, do you want them to be straight? Do you want them to be in a diagonal? I kind of like to make them on the diagonal. So I'm going to start with that. And that also means that I have, I have an end piece. And that's, that's for the cook, okay? I was <laughs> that's, just going to say. I'm putting that over there. I'm going to eat that when we're done. <laughs> when my kids, when they were little, and they would see me cutting up this goatee, they would always just run into the kitchen because there's going to be, you know, there's going to be lots of pieces around. Now this is a, these are not all the way cooked yet, right? It's just their first bake. Yep. So they're easy to cut and you get nice little slices, super nice slices. I'm gonna put those right back on the baking sheet. And so what a fun thing to do. So people were saying, oh, my grandkids are coming and people are coming make those and a fun little thing with hot cocoa. I mean, that would just be really nice. Right, and it seems complicated. Um, it seems like something that you would buy, not make. But the the great thing about making the, this recipe, it makes so many cookies. 
which is great for gifting and just having around. And like I said, they keep really well. Oops, that one broke. That's gonna go up there. And you know, they're just they're just fun. They just they just say holidays to me. They just do. So I'm gonna go ahead and do the rest of these, pop them back in the oven. So those look like they're about a half inch or a little bit smaller. Yeah, half inch. Okay. You can see them even even thinner. I like a little substance to it. I do like to dip it in my coffee. Two questions. Do you sell your aprons and have you considered creating an app for your recipes? Oh, such good questions. I know. You know, my apron, excuse me. I, my supplier um, was a casualty of the pandemic. So I can't make this exact apron anymore. I only have a few left and I love it. I love the design. So I'm actually looking for another purveyor. I'm shopping for um, a place to get aprons made. Cause I used to give them away and, you know, give them to cooking students and stuff. I have one. I love it. Yeah. So if anyone, if anyone knows a place I can do that, or I can get them personalized. I would love that. And then the app. No, I have not thought about the app. I have That's an interesting. That's an interesting suggestion. I must say. It's a great suggestion. And I should do it if I didn't already have 25 things going on right now. <laughs> You know, when you're in the grocery store and you forgot the list or whatever, you could just go right to the app rather than fumbling around in the internet more. Yeah. Yeah. And if you have any um, smart kids who like to create those sorts of things, have them contact me. Yeah. So these are going to go. This is just half. I'm going to do the other half later. Oh, so beautiful. Gonna, what will you do with the other half? Can you freeze those? You know, I'll bake it up when we're done. I just want okay. to. Um, Better to bake everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would do it all at once. So we're just going to do that for another, say, 10 minutes. And can you answer this question from Anne? I think it's a great question. Difference between bras and stock. Oh, sure. So um, stock sometimes contains bones, like sperm, chicken, or meat, but not always. So stock is a more general term. Broth um, doesn't, doesn't have any kind of a, a bone component to it. Yeah. Is one healthier than the other? Uh, yes or no, like bra stock usually has more fat in it, but the way I make my stock is I chill it and then I skim off the fat and then I put it in the freezer. I use it. So I'm kind of correcting for that. I think that with poultry stock, especially like, you know, if you're cooking chicken one night for dinner or you roast a chicken, it's really um, a shame to throw away that carcass because if you simmer that just for a couple hours with some odds and ends of vegetables and things. Um, then you're going to have an, a nutritious stock and it's going to be really rich in calcium from those bones. Okay. And so there's going to, it's going to have some adva advantages, you know, over the stuff you buy at the store or, or just vegetable broth. I also love vegetable broth and I have a recipe in, in my book that, to make it really delicious. So it's not boring tasting at all. And I use a little piece of dried seaweed, which adds so much flavor to it. It's just one of my favorite things. It's really, 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 really nice. Okay. Our soup is looking good. I'll show you this. Yeah. And I'm going to turn it down to simmer. So once it comes to a nice boil, you can turn it down to a simmer. And then, you know, we just really want the vegetables to be cooked through. We want it to develop some body, you know, so that the, the liquid cooks down a little bit. And we want that Parmesan rind to do its magic. So we're going to give this another, you know, 10 or 15 minutes. Like I could, I could serve this for dinner in 20 minutes, but I'll probably simmer it a little bit longer since I have the time. I'm so that's a quick recipe then. I mean, not, not complicated and, and make a double and freeze half. It's, it's actually a really quick recipe. And you can also buy some of these ingredients, you know, pre-chopped if you just really don't have time to do the prep work. Yeah. I'm going to make that tomorrow night. I, I just want to take a second and thank our audience. Uh, it, your comments, um, and, and I'll share these with Annie, are just so, so nice. And you're just so complimentary and so appreciative. So I, I got to take a shout out to the audience. Thank you so much. I haven't had a chance to look at the at the comments, but I'll do it later. It's really, it's really fun having you guys over. I really just feel like it's got company in the kitchen. <laughs> I think next time we do it, and I'll ask the audience, you guys can chime in. I'd love to see you guys. So maybe next time we don't do webinar, but we do a Zoom format. 
Yeah. So when I do um, with my newsletter people, we do that. We do four times a year. We do a cooking class and it's also a kitchen chat. So you talk about a brain health topic and then, you know, we all cook something. It's really fun. I love I love seeing other people cook, too. So do we have time for the fig and almond bars? Yes, we have about 10 minutes. Oh, perfect. Can I ask you a quick question? This poor person chimed in so long ago. Does cocoa power go bad? Cocoa powder? Cocoa powder. Does it go bad? I've never, I've never experienced that. I, yeah, I, I, I would uh, agree with you. Yeah. Although, you know, the way I, the way I use my ingredients, like I, you know, when my kids were home and I was cooking all the time when they were younger, now my kids are grown. So it's just my husband and me most of the time, you know, I buy things in smaller amounts because I really believe that a lot of the nutrients and foods are perishable. Um, so things like flour, for example, I don't buy like huge bags of flour. Um, there's vitamin E in that flour, right? And I want it to be as fresh as possible. Uh, things like nuts, seeds. I hadn't thought about the cocoa powder. I, I go through cocoa powder a lot. So probably would never be a problem in my house. <laughs> I make a lot of chocolate things. Um, but like in general, I love to think of food that way. Like like twice a year, I just clean out my pantry. I just did it after Thanksgiving again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, things like dried beans, like they don't last forever. You know, have you ever gotten some dried beans where you decide you want to cook them up and then they just never get soft? It's because, you know, they're just, they were probably on the shelf for a long time when you bought them. And then they were in your pantry for a year. So, so if you still have beans left over from the pandemic, you know, use them as pie weights when you make pie <laughs> <laughs> But I want your heart to break because you've been cooking these beans all day and they're just, just not, not looking good. Um, so yeah, in general, like for example, the nuts I have, um, I'll buy this, this amount. Like these are sliced almonds. I use these a lot in my granola. So I'll buy enough for just like one jar. And then, and then I can see when I'm low on things. Um, I don't like finding bags of nuts in the back of the pantry that are a couple years old. Um, they just lose their nutrients. And yeah. when it comes to brain health, it's all about nutrient density. You just want to give yourself, you know, the benefit of the doubt with all of the foods that you eat. You just want to be focused on, you know, what's the most neuroprotective foods that you choose for the first place. Those are the 10 brain healthy food groups. And then, you know, what are the highest quality ones that you can find in your area that are, you know, within your budget. And most of the foods that, you know, I am cooking with, you can find everywhere. You know, you can find them at Walmart, you can find them at, I have an Albertsons. Um, I live in Wyoming. You know, I can find all of these ingredients really easily. Every once in a while, I might order something online, but, you know, I try to make it accessible. But you want things to be fresh. Really, really important. All right, what are we doing? Oh, okay. So the fig and almond snack bars. Susan, have you made this one before? No. This is new. Um, so this is not in my book. This is on my newsletter. And this is, I've been making these for a couple years now. And I give them out as gifts and it started as I wanted to think of, you know, just a special birthday present for a friend of mine who is turning 60 and, you know, I just wanted to make her something. So I created this recipe for her. Um, the Peggy bars were the original ones, my girlfriend Peggy. Anyways, um, so I thought about, you know, what would she like? I wanted it to be a no-bake bar. So what we have here is toasted almonds. I just toasted these in the oven. Go and put these in the food processor. Um, for 15 minutes before we started. Toasted almonds just, you know, it tastes a little bit better, but you can also use cashews. It works really well. Um, and, and unsalted, I assume. Unsalted, raw. Yeah, I usually yeah. buy almonds that way. Yeah, yeah. It's, then you can control the salt. We'll add salt later, but I don't want them to be overly salty. And then these, these are dried figs. Now the fig part of the snack bar, they have to be dried, okay? I've had people try them with fresh figs and believe me, it's not going to work. It's very sad when I have it's in bold message me <laughs> <laughs> to your fresh fig because it's just you know I don't want any food to go to waste. But um, I think she I think one person made it with fresh fig. She decided to make a cake out of it instead, and that actually worked. So that's oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. So make a note on your recipe when you go to the grocery store. You want really soft figs, okay? You want these are. Um, I'll show you the packet. Those are in the refrigerated section, correct? Uh, nope. These are no. by the fruit. These are black mission figs. Okay. Um, you can also find them over by the raisins. You know, the sun-made okay. people, they make really good black mission figs dried. So the point is you don't want to just get dried out figs. They're hard and not soft because it's not going to make a good bar. 
you're going to have problems. <laughs> Believe me, I've tried. I've tried. So um, this is two cups of figs and a half, one and a half cups of almonds. And like I said, you can also use cashews. And we're going to add a quarter cup of olive oil and something sweet to bind it. And I've used different things. I've used date syrup. I've used honey. I currently don't have any date syrup, which I love the flavor of, but honey, this is honey from my farmer's market, just two tablespoons. Um, it actually gives just enough sweetness, but you also need it as a binder. So it's pretty important. And then, oh, well, teaspoon of vanilla. Now the inspiration for this recipe was a traditional cookie that you find in Italy, in Florence. And it's really common to get like these um, panforte, which are sort of like almond and fig or prune cakes. And it looks like a pie and they cut you a, a slice. And um, sometimes they're soaked in rum and you know they're boozy and you have them around the holidays, they're really festive. Um, so that was sort of the you know inspiration for this. So to have that sort of Italian feeling, I wanted to order add something orange. And I know that my friend Peggy liked orange and chocolate. So I have two options here. One is orange blossom water, which you can find at your grocery store. It smells, um, it's really subtle, really beautiful orange flavor, very, very subtle. And then I have something that's a little bit more assertive. This I have to order online from King Arthur Baking. This is Fiore di Sicilia, Flowers of Sicily. And this is orange but it's also lemon and bitter almonds and flowers. It really does smell like being in Sicily. Um, so I love this. If I have some of this on hand, I use it. If not, I just use my orange blossom water and it's still really good. So I'm doing a half a teaspoon. Like I said, that is potent stuff. And we are going to pulse it in the food processor until it looks like it's you know coming together. So this is a great recipe to do a cooking class for because, you know, when you read a recipe, sometimes it's a little bit hard to say, like how little should the chunks of, of uh, nuts be or, you know, how fine do you want it to be? And I'm going to show you, see how chunky this is? And you see how, how some of the nuts are like this big? Not yet. You want it to be finer than that because you want this to be a bar that sticks together. You know, you don't want to have it crumple too much when you cut it. So we are going to pulse it just a little bit longer. And then I'll show you what the final looks like. So he's looking good. I'm going to put my biscotti back in for like five minutes just to get them a little tipsier. And when you're doing that and you're doing other things in the kitchen, you can turn the oven all the way down to like 200 or 250, you know, if you're afraid that you're going to overdo it while you're doing other things and just let them like slowly dry in the oven. That's a great way to do it. Okay, this is what I like. See how you can pinch it? You can pinch it together. Kind of like if you've ever bought those bars called Lara bars, that's kind of what we're, the texture we're after, okay? So this looks really good. Annie, someone just asked um, the name of the item that you buy from Italy. Fiori di Sicilia. Thank you. Now you can buy this in Italy. I've seen it there. It doesn't have that name. Um, and the only domestic source I found is King Arthur Baking. Thank you. Which I actually love because I buy parchment paper and pans and things like that. From them. 
<laughs> and I think I can answer this question. I'm going to take a stab at it. Can you yeah. recommend nutritional yeast as a replacement for parm in the soup? I'm going to say yes. Huh, would I put it in the soup? No, if I we didn't have the cheese brine because you do the parm walnut. Yeah. I mean, the, the I, walnut parm that you use nutritional yeast with, right? Right. So if you, if you don't eat cheese, um, which is great, I don't eat very much cheese. I've cut back a lot. I use mostly nut-based cheeses in my cooking and my eating because they're so delicious. So what Susan's talking about is a recipe for walnut parm. Um, and it's, you make it, it looks just like this when you make it in a food processor, nutritional yeast, miso paste, walnuts, garlic, um, and then you, you make it all crumbly. I would serve that on top of the soup. Um, with nutritional yeast, you don't, you, you can cook it in things for sure, but I don't know how it would, would, I might get gummy in a soup. Okay. Well, that's a great suggestion to put it on top then. The reason I have my video off is I was asked to just speak because they couldn't see you enough. Oh, <laughs> okay. Well, which is fine. I mean, you're doing a cooking show. I'm not cooking. So, well, we'll bring you back and we can talk done when I'm sure. done. Um, so, I'm using a tart pan. This is kind of a fancy pan. You probably don't have one of these around unless you're really into making tarts. Um, but I like to make these when I make these for gifts in this pan. And then, just like the biscotti, I slice them pretty thin. You can get a lot of fig bars out of this, let me tell you. Um, this is like gifts for three people. It's really nice that way. Um, or else you could keep some for yourself too. So, but the way the recipe is written, just take like a brownie pan, you know, like an eight inch square brownie pan, line it with parchment paper, totally fine. You can cut up the bars any way you like. I use parchment paper to line it. And then I'm just going to go ahead and dump this in there. Grab a spoon. I can't believe how good my dogs have been, you guys. And they haven't had a long enough walk today. So it looks like a lot, but we're going to press it down, as you will see. And this is kind of the clincher in this whole recipe is I just want you to um, know that you have to press it very well. And so it kind of doubles as an upper body workout, which we know is really important for your brain health, right? Exercise is super important. It's just as important as nutrition. Cardio and strength training are equally important for brain health for a lot of cool reasons that have just been described. So I just went ahead and dumped all that in there. It's all crumbly, right? And I'm going to spread it out. Now to make bars, you need to like press them down a little bit. So I can use another piece of parchment or I can just use the same one. You can see that. And I like to use a, just a, a jar like this, or a, a glass or a jar, something with a heavy bottom. And this is where the uh, strength training part comes in. You want to press it as much as you can. And this is the most important part of the whole recipe. <laughs> I don't want you to um, have to email me and tell me your bars fall apart because they won't fall apart as long as your figs are nice and soft and you're able to press them down. And then I take my hands, just press everything out to the corners. You can even use like a firm spatula for that. And I'll show you another way to do it too, which is kind of fun, is to grab a metal spatula, find one. Yeah, this is another good way to do it. It's perfect for this. And there you go. That's the base for fit bars. Make sense? Now the fun part is personalizing it. 
So um, I have probably made like, I don't know, 20 different types of bars for different people. Like my husband doesn't really love chocolate as much. He loves peanut butter. So I did a peanut butter topping for him that it was, it was really good. It was like peanut butter and then crushed peanuts and um, like simple, like that's all he wanted. And then my brother, who's really into um, drinking espresso, I did his with espresso powder in a chocolate layer and then um, chocolate covered espresso beans on top. That was really decadent, you know, for the espresso lover. What I'm doing over here is I'm just melting dark chocolate in a pan. You could do this in the microwave too, in the microwave safe bowl. But I've got like a little bit of water in the bottom of this pan. I don't want the water to touch the bottom of the bowl because it will make the chocolate seize. But I'm just gonna melt this chocolate. And that is going to be our chocolate layer. I'm gonna spread it over the top. I add a little bit of olive oil to that when it's melted, which gives it a nice glossy look. And it's also um, very delicious to add olive oil to chocolate. And then I'm going to, um, you know, make my bars. I think I might do, since we have a lot of pistachios, I'm gonna do some chopped up pistachios and some hemp seeds. I don't know if you're in the habit of eating hemp seeds. These are super high in protein. Um, really, really great nutritious seed that I love to do just all sorts of things with. So, Susan, are there any questions while the chocolate is melting? Do you want to go ahead? Uh, we have answered all the questions. Let me see if any more have come in. We have a lot of thank yous. We have a lot of, this has been so wonderful. I can't wait for the recipes. Thank you, thank you, yes. So everything, Aww. how do I subscribe to the newsletter? Is it electronic Aww. or print? I can answer those things. I love the idea about the app and getting more aprons. Yeah, I love, I love the idea. Any other great ideas you wanna send my way? I'm all ears. <laughs> I just have more ideas than time sometimes. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to show you, ah, I'm gonna pull the biscotti from the oven. These are looking really good. Excited about that. I think I will drizzle them with some chocolate because, you know, it's the holidays, right? And when my chocolate is melted, I'm gonna add olive oil, just put it in a thin layer, get, my, get your sprinkles ready. You know, when that chocolate goes down, because you don't want it to harden, you want whatever seed or nut you put on it to adhere. And um, yeah, the soup's ready. The chewy chickpea cookies are ready. We've got lots of cookies to put in the freezer, lots to give away, lots to eat. And a huge pot of soup for an hour later. I'm having friends come over because um, I just told some friends I was making cookies and soup and why not come over? So we'll probably end up eating quite a bit of this. Yeah, if we live closer, we'd all be there. <laughs> but I want to thank you for having me. This is really, really fun. It's always a pleasure to talk to your community. Um, I had such a great time when I came out to visit during my book tour. I got to visit, um, I, I got to visit in New York and in California and I don't know. I just, I just have the biggest, um, biggest soft spot for everything that all of you do there and all the community and the families and the residents. I got to meet so many of the residents. Um, Annie, you can come anytime. And it was such a pleasure. And you are such a great partner and advocate. And we just, we love our relationship with you. So thank you so much. And next time we'll do this in early 2024. Um, and you can respond to the email you're going to get with a copy of the webinar with any suggestions, but I'd love to do it in just a Zoom format so we can have kind of an interactive conversation with the audience. Yeah, and next year we could probably do something, you know, after the holidays, it's always nice to make some soups and some easy light dishes, things that are quick, things that are nice in the winter. Yeah, I have a million ideas, so... Well, I'm just going to end it with more comments that are just flying in here. Wonderful recipes. Thanks for the demonstration. Thank you. Love the cookbook. Thank you again. Annie, will you be on the East Coast anytime soon? Um, I may be going to New York in September. So subscribe to the um, Brain Health Kitchen newsletter, and then she'll let you know where she's going to be. 
Yeah, I, I, I update everyone <laughs> as to my whereabouts. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Annie. Kensington thanks you for being such a great partner. Happy holidays to everybody. Happy New Year. We'll see you in 2024. Thank you so much.